All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here on a Sunday uh, for some, see some pretty significant uh, news from the organization. We're going to hear from uh, General Manager Ken Holland first, then Head Coach Chris Knobloch second, after which we'll open it up to all four gentlemen uh, for questions. So without further ado, Ken. Thanks, Tim. Uh, thank you all for coming here on short notice. Um, obviously, today's been a very difficult, tough day. Um, woke up this morning and uh, we, you know, we got in late last night and I called uh, Woody and Dave Manson and informed them that uh, we were making a coaching change. Um, obviously, I have a relationship with Woody that goes back to 2005 when he was the video coach with the, uh, with the Detroit Red Wings and uh, I want to thank them um, for the work, their contributions to our team over the last uh, two years, helping us go to the final four and the final eight. Um, they work. They work hard. They're good. They're good hockey people. But ultimately, this is a difficult, uh, difficult decision. And obviously, we're in the in a business where you've got to uh, you got to win games. And over the last, uh, you know, as we got out of the gate, and we've been, uh, you know, early on, you figure you're going to turn it around. You're into game three. You're game four. Game five. And as it started to, as our record continued to uh, get worse, Jeff and I have had uh, talking on a more than an everyday basis, probably two or three times a day over the last, uh, especially the last week, trying to figure out solutions. I've been on the phone here uh, trying to talk to other teams to see what's out there, but uh, in terms of trades, you know, but when you're 12 games into a season, um, not a lot of teams, you've got to have a trading partner. So uh, kept hoping we were going to win a game, kept hoping we were going to win a game, and really after we lost the game against San Jose on Thursday night, Jeff and I started to talk uh, really seriously about um, should we consider making a coaching change and obviously made a decision to uh, to make that decision. So uh, tough to, do, again, very difficult to deliver the news to uh, to Woody and Mance. Um, with that, um, obviously I'm excited to uh, introduce Chris Knobloch as the next head coach of the Edmonton Oilers. In 2015, when I was in uh, in Detroit, we were looking for uh, a, a head coach for the uh, Grand Rapids Griffins, and Chris was one of the th three or four finalists. So we ended up hiring Todd Nelson. Um, so I was aware in 2015 that Chris was one of the real top young coaches out there. He was coaching, uh, I believe it was Erie at the time, um, and uh, ultimately made a decision to go with a veteran. I've, I've, I've followed Chris's career from afar since uh, he got into our final, and, and he's won everywhere he's gone. He, he won a championship in the Western Hockey League. He won a championship in the OHL. Um, what took his team last year to the Final Four? He spent two years in the National Hockey League in Philadelphia as an assistant coach under Dave Haxtell and been a head coach in the American Hockey League for the last five years. And obviously, he's got roots here in, uh, in Edmonton. So um, I think one of the bright young coaches in the National Hockey League. And uh, again, like I said, I've followed his career from afar. And... Really excited to introduce uh, uh, Chris today as the next head coach of the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, thanks very much, Ken. Um, uh, first of all, I'd just uh, like to thank the Mr. Kate's family uh, for this opportunity, Ken and Jeff, for uh, reaching out and believing in me for this uh, unbelievable opportunity. Uh, but also would like to mention um, or thank the uh, New York Rangers for giving me this opportunity. Um, I know a lot of teams wouldn't have not allowed to do that, allow their head coach in the American League to um, go out. So uh, to the Rangers, Mr. Dolan, um, Chris Drury, and Ryan Martin, um, very appreciative of what they allowed me to do. And um, as for this opportunity, it's an unbelievable opportunity. It's been a crazy 24 hours for myself. I was on the bench yesterday in Hartford and now on a plane uh, to get here and um, here to be able to coach the um, Edmonton Oilers um, with uh, such a strong um, hockey uh, culture, uh, history, and passionate fans, you know, to be here as a head coach is a little bit of a dream for me. Um, you know, I'm from around here. I came from Saskatchewan. I came here to play uh, junior hockey in, I believe it was 1996 for the Edmonton Ice. Stayed here, uh, played for the University of Alberta, Golden Bears. Met my wife here, um, have a lot of friends here, and just uh, 
so the fact that I have this opportunity to be here with the Oilers back in Edmonton is um, really, really exciting for me. Excellent. Thanks very much, Chris and Ken. Uh, we'll open it up uh, to the floor uh, for questions. Just please uh, state your name and uh, organization before you ask the question. So go ahead. Uh, Jason Greger, Sports 1440. Uh, Jeff and Ken, kind of for both of you. Can, um, this organization, Jay Woodcroft had like a over 600 winning percentage, six most points since he's been here. Um, at what point or can you take about the discussion of, you know, the coach pays the price again for a group that's underachieved, and that's happened a few times here. Um, I think that's why I've said it's a difficult decision. Uh, you know, certainly we've played at a high level under, for, you know, I think we had the second best winning percentage over the last 120 games under Jay, but, you know, we're in the win now mode, and we, I think we've talked about that over the last uh, few years that I've been here, I think since I've got here, when you look at our team, the players on the team, the age of the team, um, the time is now uh, to try to win. Um, I, I guess we could get into debate, is 12 games or 13 games enough? Um, I think if you wait another 10 games um, and things don't change, it's probably too late. So we just felt that, uh, um, Jeff and I felt that uh, it was something that needed to be done. And uh, Chris, can you talk about, um, you're coming as a coach in a situation like this. I don't, I don't know if you've been in a situation like this. How, how quickly do you, can you put, put your fingerprints on a new team as a head coach? Um, I've only had one experience of coming in mid-season. That was a long time ago. Um, and when I met with uh, these guys and explained my, um, my experience coming in uh, mid-season, and the first time I'll admit I did terribly I, and I learned so much from it and I know it's important that you're coming mid-season you can only do so much on changing the systems and uh, lines and the players have to have some stability and there are things as a coach you want to put your stamp on and this is really important for me I see that we're failing in this area we need to improve that uh, but as a coach coming in you can only do so much you can only change so many areas um, I really want to get um, involved, uh, reach out to all my the coaching staff. I met them just briefly a few moments ago, but um, make some progress there on the lay of the land, what's going on with the team. Um, I have my opinions. I certainly want to hear theirs, um, but I also want to reach out and talk to the players, um, the veterans, young players, get their perspective, let them know what I'm expecting from them, and... Um, Ultimately, I see a, a very talented team um, underperforming. Obviously, that's why I'm here. But um, ultimately, I'm trying to build something, and um, we can um, obviously have the su success that was anticipated at the beginning of the year. Thank you. Well, one Ready. thing, I, Ryan, before the other thing, I, I didn't when we started to clap. Obviously, uh, Paul's on the end of the table there. Paul Coffey. Uh, Paul is going to replace Dave Manson. Uh, to, to uh, work with our defensemen. Obviously, Paul's the greatest defenseman in the, the history of the Oilers franchise. Uh, he's been with the organization now a number of years. Paul's watched every game, uh, has a relationship with all our, our players, especially our defensemen. Um, and, uh, you know, he's been around a lot, you know, on our team for, for stretches. You, you guys have seen him around here. So, uh, I've talked to pa Paul a lot over the over the time, so I think Paul is a great man to come in and uh, work with our defensemen. And uh, like I said, he really knows the team, and I think he'll really be beneficial with uh, with Chris. Thanks, Ken. Go ahead. Uh, good. And Ken, since you mentioned it, maybe I'll start with that, Paul. If I can. Uh, it's definitely unique to have an assistant coach who's also a, an advisor to the owner. I think that's pretty unique in the league. Maybe just a thought on how. You know, you, you handle both of those roles and make sure that chain of command and everything just all makes sense for everybody. Well, that's all about respect and, you know, the respect I have for this organization and Daryl is uh, second to none. I will say out of the gate that I wasn't lobbying for this job. I know that Ken and, uh, and Jeff had talked quite a bit and Jeff kind of said something to me the other day, would you ever think of coaching? And I said, uh, I said, no, I'm very uh, happy with my position. I'm happy with the strategy and the conversations I have with Daryl and, and Kenny, et cetera, in the organization. And uh, 
Uh, it kind of came about yesterday afternoon. My wife, I told her 6.30 last night. Um, that, was a, that was a shocker to her. But for me personally, um, nothing but respect for Jay and Dave. It's, uh, it's terrible that two great coaches had to take the burden of the start of this team because I think uh, there's a better start out there. But stuff happens, and, and as most of you know in this room, that I'm very tied with the Oilers. I love the Oilers. Uh, all of us do, all of us that won cups in this organization. It was, uh, it was still to Jeff, no, but I'll do anything to help. And then uh, having a quick conversation with Chris prior to his game last night and uh, getting a feel for him, getting a feel for his strategies. And uh, I thought, I just said, hey, any way I can help, um, I will. And that puts me here today. Um, I'm an assistant coach. I work, for, I work for Chris, I work for Ken. Uh, Jeff's higher up, Daryl's the owner of the team, but my focus will be on the players. Have I ever coached in the NHL? No. Do I understand the game? Yes. Do I understand players? Yes. Do I how to make them better? Yes. Can I communicate with them? Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I guess, Kenny, I'll direct this at you, but Jeff, if you want to address it, um, you know, when you're new coaching in the NHL, some early speed bumps can be normal, uh, and all due respect, Chris. Uh, the margin for error for this team is very slim. So is there a concern level that, you, you know, you're putting people in place that haven't necessarily run those miles as, head, as a head coach in the NHL, considering the dire nature of the situation? Well, I think, as, as Chris said, I think certainly Glenn Gullickson and, and Mark Stewart are going to be very, and, and Koff, too. I mean, Koff, is, like I said, Paul has watched, uh, he knows our team. He was in training camp. Uh, he watches play uh, all the time. So I think the... You know, I know that Chris and I talked, he's watched some video of our, our, our quickly on the, on the plane or in the last 24 hours, he's watched some video of our, of our recent games. But certainly, I think he'll probably lean on uh, the people that have been here in the short um, time until he gets a feel for the, uh, the team. Obviously, the hope is, you know, from my hope, when I, you know, it's almost two years ago that I made the decision, obviously, to go from Dave Tippett to, uh, to Woody. Um, and the team really responded. Uh, I know what he come in again. I don't think he made a whole lot of change. He made a few tweaks, um, and then he, you know, you think he went to 11 and seven and did a couple of things, and and we uh, were about six or seven games out of a uh, points out of a playoff berth and played our way into the playoffs and went on to the final four. So there's more time. There's still 69, 68 games to go um, on the early going. I think he'll probably lean on the people that have been here and um, and implement the things that are that are really important to him. Rob. Uh, for uh, this one's for Ken. So, what happened with with Jay? Was, did the team tune him out, or what was the uh, issue here? No, I don't think they tuned him out. I I, I think that uh, there's probably some players in there that are disappointed um, about this decision today. Um, I'm paid to make decisions, uh, difficult decisions. Some decisions work, some decisions don't. But certainly, I felt that again with lots of communication with Jeff, just felt that um, needed to make a change. We, were, we weren't playing good enough. I think, there's, again, there's lots of runway left with this change to try to uh, uh, make a surge here and try to play our way back into the, the, the mix. Um, but I, I don't think he's, they lost him, but I, I couldn't wait around for another 10 games, 15 games to find out. And a, and a question for Jeff. Now, this is five coaches in just a little over eight years for this core group. Is it fair now to say that the core group might be where some of the fixing needs to be done? Well, I would say that, um, you know, I, I came in three months ago uh, into this job sort of with a long-term view of getting some structure and strategy. I, I sat here in front of you guys then. Um, that's still the case. I can't control what happened in the past with coaching changes, different managers over the years. I think our focus is that we have a team that we believe should compete for the Stanley Cup. I'm a long-term strategy person, but I'm also here to try to win this year. So, um, like Ken said earlier, we've been talking a lot. We've got our entire pro scouting group and analytics group working overtime on um, scenarios to try to make us better. We're pursuing every avenue uh, to do that. 
bringing in Chris was a decision, like Kenny said, that we thought we had to make. Um, although he doesn't have head coaching experience in the NHL, I think with 12 years as a head coach, winning championships in other leagues, developing players in the American League, had a little opportunity in New York to be a head coach uh, on an interim basis. <clears throat> he has a very good feel for, for the players. He knows how to um, he knows how to take the really star players and empower them, but more importantly, he gives everyone a role. Um, and they know what the role is, and there's accountability at the end of the day. And that's the thing that I've watched it over the years with Chris. I was uh, <clears throat> very close to the team when they were in Erie. I had a lot of clients not just Connor McDavid. Um, I had clients of ours when I was an agent in Hartford. I've seen what he can do with, with teams, so uh, all of that put together, that's why uh, Chris is sitting here today. I want to add one thing to that. When you, you know, Rob, you say, I, want to, I believe in the core. I mean, we've played, I think nobody's played more than five playoff games the last two years. You know, some teams won four, and then, you know, we've gone to the final four, we've gone to the final eight, um, last year we were we were top five or six in the league in points, um, so we have we we've played we've lost to the last two Stanley Cup champions um, in series, and they've beat us and won on won the cup. So I believe in the core. I just think it's that we're in the prime. We're 13 games in. The time is now, and just. Could we wait a 10 more, 10 more games? Obviously, we won a real good game last night. Could we all of a sudden parlayed last night into a win on Monday and a win on Wednesday and a win? Don't, I, I can't read the future. Made a decision that um, felt we needed to make a change to kind of to um, jumpstart our season. I don't, I don't think it's got any, you know, on the, on the, on the core. The, the core has done it. We've, gone to the, we've, we've done it over the last two years. So it's just... It's it's the nature of the National Hockey League. It's it's tough. It's 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 a hard league, and uh, we we didn't want to wait around any longer. Uh, we'll go up front here to Tom. Uh, Tom Edmonton Sports Talk. Uh, Tom Gazzola. Uh for Jeff or, or Kenny. Um, obviously, a decision like this comes with a, a lot of deliberation. You guys have to meet and discuss. Um, does the players' leadership group come into the conversation? Were they brought in to to discuss potential uh, options for this team moving forward? Is that something that you guys? Uh, bring into consideration or have done before? I'll let, you know, because I, I did talk, I have talked over the, this past week um, with with uh, some of the veterans on our team. Um, I'm not going to tell you what they said. I take the information. Ultimately, I have, to make, I have to make decisions. Obviously, Jeff's got a long, long, long relationship with, uh, with Connor. You can probably talk about that. Yeah, no, I mean, we didn't consult with the players on this decision. <clears throat> Never spoke with Connor or Leon or Nuge or Nursey or any of the other leadership group. Um, these guys are here to play hockey. That They they know that. That's what they want to do. Um, they don't like being involved in these types of decisions. Uh, that's my experience. Um, so the fact that... You know, Chris was Connor's coach in Erie in 2014, 15. It, it only has something to do with this because I think Chris Knobloch's a very good coach. <clears throat> uh, Connor didn't have anything to do with this decision and neither did the other uh, leadership group. <clears throat> just one more uh, in terms of the assistant coaches. I know, Chris, you're coming in here. You just had a chat with them. Um, everybody's role kind of staying the same in terms of the guys that are still sticking around on the coaching staff. Yes. Yes, everything's staying the same. Obviously, there's going to be some different responsibilities. Um, I'm going to get to know them. As I said, I've only talked to them briefly uh, a few moments ago. But uh, I really want to know what their strengths are, how they feel that our team could be playing better. Um, and, you know, I've talked to Paul myself a little bit, a little more in depth. And um, I just think I'll be making some decisions on what's best for uh, the coaching staff and where we can delegate um, so we're, we're the strongest. Thank you. Uh, we'll go over here to Derek. <clears> Hi, <throat> hey, Chris. Um, I just wanted to add just your thoughts on your relationship with Connor McDavid and how does the relationship change from when you had him in junior to now a superstar in the NHL? Well, I'm sure it's going to change uh, quite a bit. Um, I was very happy, obviously, is uh, an understatement to have him in junior. Um, I had him when he was 15 for half a season, 16, he was 
by then he was one of the best players in the league and by 17 he was absolutely starred, dominated the league, did not deserve or did not belong there. He was just that, that good. Um, so the fact that I got to coach him in Erie, I feel very fortunate to have that opportunity. And now to be able to do it twice is, uh, you know, I'm pretty, pretty lucky there. So um, I, as for the relationship, um, you know, over the years we've stayed in touch a little bit, but uh, just with some of the odd text or whatever, but um, not, not in great detail. And just seeing him from afar this season, what are your impressions of, of him? He's obviously not playing at the level that he has here for a little while. There's been some questions about his health, but I'm just wondering what, you, what you've seen out of Connor so far this year. Um, what I see out of him is what I see from uh, a lot of the team. Um, a team that's trying very hard, very passionate, want to win, want to do what's right, but ultimately right now are very frustrated. And as a player who's played any kind of sport, obviously in hockey, that if you are frustrated or feeling down, it is tough to perform at the highest level. And as Ken said earlier, this is a very difficult league and you need your Certainly, you need all your players playing their best, but your best players being their best. And right now, I want Connor and everyone just to take a breath, relax, play hockey, and find some joy into it, and um, play the way they can. Because right now, I just think there's too much pressure on them, and they're feeling it. Um, so that's that's my take on from what I've seen afar from watching some video, but. Um, you know, when I talk to those guys, maybe I get a different different perspective, but that's what I see right now. Thank you. We'll go to uh, Steve on this side. Hi, is that Steven Sandor from Canadian Press? And, and maybe just want to clarify some, some timeline stuff here with Jeff and Ken. You said you started speaking about this Thursday night after the loss in San Jose, but when did you actually come to the final decision that, yes, the change is made, the phone calls are going to start going out? Uh, was it before the Seattle game? Yes, yesterday afternoon. Jeff and I talked yesterday afternoon. The team was on the road, obviously, in Seattle um, and made a decision that uh, we were going to, obviously, to get the wheels in motion, um, we, have to, we have to get uh, permission from the Rangers, um, had to obviously negotiate a contract. Um, you know, we played, played Saturday, played Monday, we played Wednesday, so whether it was yesterday or the day before, it wasn't something that could just transpire in 12 hours. It was, you know, we got to... We had to get him from Hartford to here, so uh, um, officially made the decision at some point in time Saturday during the game, and made the decision that when we got home uh, last night, that I would talk, I would meet with uh, with Jay and uh, and Dave, and I met with him this morning. Have Have you ever had a situation like that in your managerial career where you knew you had a coach that was going to go out and coach a game, and basically that was going to be it? No, I mean, I, obviously, the first time I made the change uh, mid-season was when I let Dave Tippett go and brought in um, Woody um, two years ago. So uh, every other time I made a, you know, my coaches, Scotty Bowman retired. Um, Dave Lewis went into a, a work stoppage and, and they made a change coming out of a work stoppage. I had Mike Babcock for 10 years and he became free and left to go to Toronto. Um, and I did, I did make the change with, with Dave Tippett. So this, this would be a first. Jason? Uh, Chris, Jason Gregor, Sports 1440. Um, the, the one thing that's kind of been s consistent around Edmonton is goals against have been too high. If you want to be a championship team, you look at the teams who win, they lower their goals against. They did it down the stretch last year, but then not in the playoffs. And obviously this year it's not that level. As a head coach, how do you get your players to buy into the consistency necessary to be good defensively? Well, first thing, and I'm sure every coach talks about it, is if you're going to have success in this league, you have to be good defensively and reduce your goals against. And that's on the penalty kill and five-on-five -five play is obviously a big part of that. Um, and throughout the years, I think last year, I think the 15 of the top 17 teams made the playoffs, or top defensive teams on goals against made the playoffs. And the year before that, it was 16 of 19. So obviously there's very strong correlation that if you are a good defensive team, you're going to have success winning games. And I think any player wants to have success individually, but um, it feels a lot better winning as a team. And I think my time as a head coach and certainly my time in Erie is I was fortunate to have some really good offensive players. And 
throughout my time, I don't think I hindered their offensive production at all. But my time there, we were always either first or second in goals against average. And I think um, I try to empower my players to commit to playing defense uh, without having to sacrifice any offense. And, um, you know, that's certainly a message that I'm going to try and instill into our, into our team. And um, hopefully, um, if I'm going to be successful, you know, it'll show with the, the, the wins. We'll go back to this side. Jack, go ahead. Chris, you mentioned it's no easy task coming in midseason, and you were embedded in that Rangers organization. In terms of relationships, who may serve as linchpins for you to start building those relationships and, and working that side of the coaching side? Because obviously there's X's and O's, and there's relationships with your players. Um, so sorry, can you... I'm not sure I understood your question. Uh, when you take over midseason, you're a Ranger guy. You don't have a lot of pre-existing relationships yeah. here with that. What will be your process in terms of establishing those relationships with players, which arguably are just as important as the X's and O's? All right. Well, I think uh, my first resource is obviously um, the, the coaching staff, um, the Stewie, Glenn, um, that have been with the group for a while. Um, obviously, these men up here with me, um, I've already on the flight um, have been talking about what this player needs, what's his identity. Obviously, I know some of these players very well from watching them on NHL, um, watching NHL games, and um, some of these players I've coached. Um, so I have my um, my view on what players bring, but you know that's just a, a shell of what what they really are, and I think. I need to get some more information from these guys, and then I need to get to know my players. And tomorrow, um, hopefully I can start tonight with some phone calls, but tomorrow when I meet with them, try and meet as many as possible and get some, um, building some relationships. And you know, I'm sure they'll f share their frustration. I'm sure a few of them will be hesitant on, you know, was this coaching change necessary? You know, some are gonna be very excited about it, you know, um, but I think in my, uh, my career as a coach I've done a pretty good job of connecting with my players giving them an identity and working on them to become better players so you know tomorrow is going to be a, a big step first step Great. we'll go to Kevin Kevin Carey sports 1440 for Ken how difficult was it with Dave Manson because of what he's had to go through the last four or five months personally how tough of it was to make that call it was, with Dave? It, it was incredibly difficult um, I would say it was emotional. Um, I mean, I, I, you, know, I, you build relationships with people, right? And, 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 and I, I was, you know, I went to um, Prince Albert in August for the celebration of life you know, for Mance's wife. And uh, um, my wife, Cindy, they were, they were good friends. So it's, it was, you know, the, the, on top of the, just the decision, certainly there's that factor into... Um, the decision made it all much, that much more difficult. So that's why today is an incredibly difficult day. This was the first, uh, Jeff, maybe I'll ask you, this was the first decision, big decision as a management group that, that this group has come together and made. Just, I mean, where did the final decision lay? How was the process on where the trigger was finally pulled? Whose call in the end is this? So Kenny said it best. I think we've been talking. Well, we've been talking a lot every day for since the beginning of the season, since we lost in Vancouver on opening night, and that dialogue's been going on the entire time. Uh, we agreed on a lot of things, and the the one thing we agreed on was that we've been very inconsistent. Um, we played 13 games. I think we probably played eight or nine really good periods in there. We've had stretches in games where we look dominant, and then we've sort of fallen off. So, you know, that sort of was the theme of our discussion is like our consistency has, is not where it needs to be. And we talked a lot the last two, three days. There was no ultimate decision maker. We talked about it. I was like, what do you think? Here's what I think. And we came to the decision together. Kenny, we've been hearing consistently from, from not just Jay, but from the players, <coughs> that it's not necessarily systems, it's, it's big mistakes, right? Big critical mistakes at bad times in games. The, the highlights bear that out. But 
do you think that accountability was an issue or is an issue with this group that when big mistakes are made, coaches have ways of holding players accountable? Was there enough on this team right now? Does there need to be more in-game accountability with players so that these big mistakes start to diminish? You know what? That's a great question. I'm not sure if I got, you know, if I had the specific answer, we probably would have addressed it far sooner than, 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 than this. I mean, the coaching staff, you know, was doing video every day. And I mean, they were, I've sat in a bunch of the, the meetings here um, over the last week and, you know, working on this and working on that. Um, so they're trying to hold them accountable. I think all coaches are trying to hold their players accountable. You know, some are better at it than others because maybe they're for whatever their message is or how they do it or, you know, I think it, it, got a, it gets to be a little more difficult when you have a 21-man roster than when you've got a 23-man roster. Uh, I mean, for the most part, you know, almost every game we, we play, we only can dress the players that are healthy. Um, so, you know, the coaches can use the, you know, when you've got a 23-man roster, 14, 7, and 2, you can healthy scratch some forwards and you can healthy scratch a defenseman. We haven't that, had that at our disposal because of the salary cap and the decisions that I made uh, on the team in the offseason. So that's one tool that the coach, coaches use that wasn't at, 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 at Jay's um, you know, fingertips. Um, you know, certainly you see some, in some uh, games uh, players get set out for, what, half a period or a period to get their attention. Um, Woody and I did talk about that, so it's not like we haven't talked about that. Ultimately, he didn't do it, and, um, and um, you know, we were, I, I was fine with that. I, I, I understood the reasons why, and we went over, but, and again, it wasn't, Ryan, it wasn't, it hasn't been one, it's been, it's been, it's been these consistent, you know, these mental, I call them boo-boos, they're mental mistakes that, you know, you play, you can do lots of good things, and all of a sudden you have one mental mistake, a bad pinch, or a bad this, or a bad turnover, and it's it's in the net, and it, it, it it's not only that the, the the one goes on the board; it's what it does to your whole team. Cycle, it's like drip, 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 um, and probably was something that we 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 had going on again last year. And then at the deadline, when we got, uh, you know, I'm talking, I guess, the defensive aspect of the puck. When we brought in Echo, and we finished I think, the ninth best team in the league. Um, in goals against, I think you know. First off, it was bringing in Eki. You're bringing in a you know big a big six foot four guy that can play 20 minutes. But also, it's it's the what it, what it does to the team emotionally. They really res responded to it, and now we're kind of back to drip drip drip. And I don't really know if that's on on Jay or or, or Woody. Obviously, we made a coaching change, and I'm hoping that with the coaching change that we're that it's going there's going to be less of those mental mental mistakes. Chris, just, sorry, just one last one. Chris, what's your approach to, I mean, this is a team that has been talking about big mistakes all year. What's your approach to trying to, to help players get that out of their game? You know, your approach to accountability versus, you know, trying to work with these guys. Uh, yeah, that's probably the most difficult thing with coaching is um, holding guys accountable because um, as a coach, you don't want your players playing in fear. You don't want them every time they're over the, uh, hit the ice over the uh, boards, is this the shift that um, I make a mistake and i out of the lineup? Is it when I get benched, all that? You want your players feeling empowered that they can make a play and um, contribute to the team. But obviously, um, accountability is very important. And as a coaching staff, it's very important for us to empower the players on having the confidence and making the right plays um, giving them guidance, direction on what to do in each situation. And if there is mistakes as a coaching staff, you got to be able to live with them. But if they're coaching staff or mistakes that happen over and over again, or if they're lazy mistakes, um, then obviously that's where you have to hold them accountable. And, you, and the biggest part of holding uh, players accountable is just taking away ice time, whether they come out of the lineup or you withhold their next shift or is it a period or whatever it is, um, ultimately that's the um, currency that a head coach has. We've got time for a few more. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Paul, just over here, Derek. I um, just want to ask you about what, what have you not liked from the blue line so far this year and how do you approach to try and fix some of those 
errors or mistakes that we were just talking about here? Well, A, I've liked, I've liked everything about our blue line. Unfortunately, sometimes we've been a little bit inconsistent. Uh, why I say that is because there's guys that have really good games. I think the simplest thing for me with Chris and, and Stewie and, and Gully, our approach, my approach is going to be anyway, just trying to get them as consistent as possible, not trying to play outside themselves, play their game, and, uh, and, and play the odds. Know where you are in the ice at all times, stay off your backhand, but I, I like our defense. I think we're, we've got a really good defense, but defense isn't one or two players. It's a group, and I think if we play as a tan, I mean, I always said as a defenseman, you need to know what your partner's doing before he does. I'd like us to communicate a little more, but uh, I like our defense, and, and we're only going to get better. Bob, Bob Stoffer, Chris, uh, just a thought. Uh, you've had some success with Hollowell this year down in uh, Hartford, but the Oilers tried to switch to more of his own defense. They pivoted away in Calgary in the Heritage Classic, went back to a hybrid. What do you sort of play defensively, and are, are you a more assertive coach in terms of what you want to see at the neutral zone because this is a team that likes to skate a bit. Um, yeah, through the neutral zone, I think uh, you talk or you hear NHL coaches talk what success, what is su successful, sorry. And it's about playing fast, moving the puck up immediately, giving the, um, getting the puck to the forwards to make plays. And the longer that we hold the puck, and as we say, dust it off and slow the game down. All it allows is the opposition to get into position, um, get into their structure, which makes it just more difficult to um, generate any offense. So one of the things that the, Paul and I have been talking quite a bit about and our team is going to hear about is playing fast. But um, and mostly that comes from our defensemen moving the puck up. And we do have some defensemen that are very capable of skiing the puck up. And there's going to be times where that is necessary. But ultimately, it is getting the puck up the ice as quick as possible into our forward's hands to make plays. And um, simpler is often the best play. And um, so that answers your neutral zone um, question. As for the defensive zone, we're going to exactly look at what um, the Oilers were doing in these past few games. Personally, I feel much more comfortable with a zone, um, more of a zone structure uh, defense. Um, I think with the personnel that we have here, it's going to be very similar to what they were doing, um, where a lot of teams in the NHL are kind of going to that type of system where the defensemen stay in their quadrants uh, closer around to the net, have the forwards, low forward, uh, expand a little bit more. Um, certainly, I want to be more aggressive in the defensive zone. The less time you spend in the D zone, the less time there is opportunities to take penalties, make mistakes, and ultimately give up goals. Um, I want to encourage our players to play fast and strong in the defensive zone, but I also want to be in, that, in the offensive zone um, where we can take advantage of them um, not being prepared, not being in their structure, because often that's where goals happen. They come off mistakes. And the slower you play, less opportunities you have to uh, take advantage of those mistakes. Great, thank you. Final question. Hi, Chris. Tony Brar, Oilers TV. In your four plus seasons as the head coach in Hartford, what are some of the lessons and experiences that you can leverage to get this team to play to its capabilities? Well, I, I learned a lot of lessons in Hartford and my junior hockey and um, my time in Philadelphia. But I think the most important thing is your players just have to feel good about themselves to perform. And right now I see some guys who are very, um, they're beaten up. They are frustrated. They put so much pressure on themselves to perform and, and it just hasn't been healthy for them. So, um, you know, sometimes when you get a new head coach, it almost starts, it's a new regular season. Season, last season's over and you're starting a new one. It's a fresh. Everyone starts and you hear about hitting the playoffs. Everyone's got zeros, meaning no one's got a goal, no one's got an assist. It's a new season. Um, ultimately, that's what you get with a new head coach. It's a reset. And, you know, I hopefully our players see this, it takes the pressure off them and, all right, let's, let's get back to basics. And I think... It's just not going to happen with a new coach um, or a new message. 
Um, but I do think that there is a very strong group in there, a very talented group, and things will get worked out, and um, it'll be a very successful and entertaining hockey year. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and uh, welcome back to Edmonton, Chris. Uh, we're going to uh, end the formal part of the press conference here uh, with a photo op. Thank you.